So welcome to the law school, Harvard Law School. Here it's a new building, so uh, it's the first year that they opened it, so you can see it's pretty nice. But uh, first I want to thank all of y'all for coming to uh, this Harvard Latino Conference uh, on behalf of all the schools that are represented at Harvard. It's great to see uh, more Latinos here on campus at one time. Yes. So uh, thank y'all for taking time of y'all's busy schedule and, and coming out here, especially the ones that travel across the country. And I've had some from Seattle and California and stuff like that. So welcome and hopefully the younger ones won't be the last trip that you come here. Hopefully you'll come here to grad school or professional school one day. So today uh, we have the privilege of having uh, Herman Trejo, who's also a, a good personal friend of mine. So this is a you know, great uh, chance that he gets here, come here to visit me here at Harvard. So it was a good way for him to come here without having to spend a lot of money. So it worked out for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Herman Trejo, I'm gonna be a little bit brief on what he has here so you can see his bio. Uh, but Herman is currently the president and chief strategist of GNT Consultant a consulting uh, firm, the, he's a political strategist, and I've known him for several years. Uh, before he started his company, he was real involved on the grassroots uh, GOTV and presidential elections uh, with John Kerry in Wisconsin, which he was one of the leaders there for the Latino vote. And it's also, he's worked with the Obama campaign the last two elections. Uh, specifically, this last election in 2012, he was a big part of the effort and energy in Florida to get the support there, as many of y'all know, was a very important state in which uh, brought home um, indicated the presidency for Obama. But before that, Herman grew up in Ohio, which is also a very important state, in which he was very instrumental in that state every time there was an election to make sure he had the Latino vote come out and support him. Herman is uh, from Morelia, Michoacan, in Mexico. And he got his degree, as you can see, from the Ohio State, as he always corrects me. But uh, good thank God that my school, the Texas a and University, is a lot better this year <laughs> than the Ohio State. But uh, Herman is going to talk a lot about what his experience in how to run campaigns. Uh, as Luz Robles, who's here that we heard earlier, the senator from Utah, has uh, had the opportunity to work with Herman in her campaign, so I think he might share some details about that. Uh, also, I want to recognize there's a guest with us, Luis Fernandez. He's uh, from Mexico. He's also a friend of Herman that's come here to the conference. And he's a supplement as a senator in Mexico. Because in Mexico, when you run as a senator for the whole country, you run as a team with a supplement. And so that's what he's here with that, with uh, Senator Camacho from Mexico. So we're very privileged to have him with us. And also Karina is one of the uh, employees for Herman's consulting firm who works with him as, a, as a, the grassroots level campaigns. As you can see, Herman has had a, a lot of experience doing 48 political races. As he'll talk about, he does a lot of the Latino, pretty much exclusively Latino Democrats around the whole nation, where it's mayor, where it's uh, city councilman, anything like that, and also the presidents that we talked about. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all, Herman Trejo. He's going to do the presentation, and we'll have some Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. OK, yes. good. So thank you so much for being here today, and thank you, Jose, for that presentation and introduction. Uh, I want to, uh, of course, recognize the elected officials that are here, people that come from uh, representing uh, the political and democratic uh, work in the, in the Latino community. So, uh, uh, Humberto Fernandez, you already, you know, everybody uh, was already um, aware that he's here, and, and thank you for coming from Mexico City exclusively to participate in this conference. Of course, uh, my first client and uh, an inspiration, uh, State Senator Luz Robles from the state of Utah. Thank you, Luz, for And a person that is that is uh, you know someone that that, that uh, represents the labor movement in, in, in Washington and also at the national level, Chuck Rocha, who's also an alumni from from Harvard University and also the representative of the, of the largest Latino super PAC. So those of you thinking about running, you gotta uh, look at, at, at Chuck and try to get a business card and, and so forth. So thank you, Chuck, for for, be, for being here and, and and all of you. And, and in particular, I want I want to thank. Uh, you know, um, the, the, the part of my staff that is here, Karina Carrasco, who 
not only uh, uh, travels with me, but she's also uh, working on the ground in uh, Dallas, Texas, as we're doing two uh, races over there right now. We're doing 11 races at this moment in, in uh, five states, but uh, in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, she's, she's doing finance and fundraising for one of our candidates and field for another candidate. So thank you so much for having that with here. And thank you, everyone. And I took the, 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 the jacket and everything because political campaigns are a little, a little more uh, informal than the suit and jacket and all of that. All of that. I also want to recognize and thank um, our friends from, from uh, the University of, of uh, New York that are here. Thank you for, for traveling and bringing some students and, and, and all of that. I appreciate that. So we're going to talk about, um, and, and, and you've been participating in this conference, and, and we've been talking about education. We've been talking about uh, building infrastructure from the business, from the policy, from the uh, political component. And, and, and I think that we all recognize that there is a, a, a need for Latino empowerment and there's a deficit right now in where we're standing as a, as a community uh, across the country, if it's in the business community, if it's in the political community, if, whatever it is. And so uh, very often when we go to these conferences, we come with ideas and, 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 and an inspiration on, on, on how to do different things. And I want to do a little bit more of a pragmatic approach, something that a lot of times when you come to a conference is not uh, discussed, which is a step-by-step -step, um, on how to uh, run for office, how to become an elected official. And so we've done 47 races, not 23, and our clients, uh, you know, we represent clients in, in different states. Last year with the 27 races, helped elect, elect uh, 11 state representatives um, in uh, different states, so and most of my clients, 90% of my clients are Latino, 90% of my clients are Democratic. I'm doing uh, two races that are not um, Democratic, one that is not Democratic, one that is not Latino. So uh, feel free to, to take notes and ask, and ask questions. And so, how do we become an elected official? Just hire my firm. That's, that's, that's you know, the simple uh, way to do it. But here we're going to talk about uh, six different things. We'll talk about central questions that you need to ask yourself uh, when, when you're thinking about running for office. Uh, we need to understand what are the resources that you need to have in order to have a successful campaign. Uh, we're also going to talk about the initial steps, and, and that's kind of like those three steps or those three points are kind of like the preparation of uh, where you want to be before you make the decision. Once you make the decision, then uh, the, the fundraising communications and my favorite and most important, at least I consider that, uh, the field components are what are going to take you from, from being a candidate to becoming an elected official. So the first thing is, uh, and this is something that I ask uh, all my candidates, these are two central questions. Why am I running and why am I going to run? Those two questions are going to be asked to you if you're running for office over and over and over during the course of the, of the campaign. Why am I running? Why am I going to win? And the first thing that you, that you have to understand when you make that decision, this is not a question about throwing your resume there and saying, oh, I'm running because I'm, you know, I've served on these boards and I've been in this position selected and, you know, because of my ideology. It has to be uh, a four uh, point that I call the circle of the why am I running. First is the purpose. And the purpose is very important because that is the reason why you are starting this venture. You know, if it's because you want to change your community, because you want to empower a group of people within the, the, your district, within your city, within any of the, of the different boundaries that you uh, aim to represent, that is very important. The second thing is every campaign needs to have a drive. That is the engine of the campaign. And the, and the, and the, the, the drive is just something as important that, that needs to come from the candidates. Because Many campaigns think that by hiring us consultants and a big team and, and, and just do different things that, that you're going to end up winning, and it's not the case. The engine of the campaign is a candidate. You need to be willing to knock on doors. You need to be willing to spend hours every day calling, fundraising uh, resources. You need to be willing to take um, the necessary steps to, to drive the campaign. The third, the third step is the strategy that is so important. You need to know where you're standing right now, what your district looks like, how many people, demographics, etc., etc. You need to have a path to victory that is clear. Who am I going to reach? How am I going to reach them? What are the, 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 the different tools and strategies that I'm going to utilize? 
But the most important one to me is the heart. And, and I, was, uh, I was looking the other day at, at, a, at a video uh, said uh, explained the difference between uh, Apple and Microsoft. You know, both uh, computer uh, firms, are, you know, they sell computers, right? What, why we don't see the lines outside of them? You know, Best Buy or Microsoft offices trying to buy the, 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 the newest uh, uh, version of, of whatever computer. But there are lines waiting for iPhones, iPads, and so forth because it is the heart, it is the, the passion that is behind the product that makes that product successful. And you have to see yourself as a product. You have to bring that component that is the heart component into, into really what you're trying to achieve here, which is representing people that otherwise will not be represented. People that want you to have a seat in the table so you can carry their voice and you can bring those issues that are so important to them and to... President, to look at the story of Latino... So, let me... It was in America. A little, bit, a little bit of a technical challenge here. We'll do it here. And so, in order to do that, I want to, I want to show you a video uh, of one of the, of the... This is not a political campaign, but it's a campaign that we did in, with uh, four different organizations. Uh, as you know, uh, several years ago, the, the CNN had uh, Lou Dobbs as uh, one of the anchors, and Lou Dobbs started to uh, attack Latinos uh, and uh, label us with different um, components that weren't necessarily true. So four organizations came together with pretty much uh, a very low bu uh, budget, and we, you know, put together different strategies to try to stop Lou Dobbs. We were, we were not really uh, looking at him to be uh, leaving CNN, but that was the end result. But I want to show you this video that uh, talks about... We have so many stories to tell. This October, CNN will take an unprecedented look at the story of Latinos in America. We have so many stories to tell. We're a rich culture. We've got a lot to offer to this country. Illegal aliens. So overwhelmed by criminal illegal aliens. Illegal aliens are in the country, including many murderers and rapists. Lou Dobbs has done more to slander Latin people in this country than any other single human being. Mr. Dobbs represents a ongoing threat to CNN's credibility as a serious news organization. Dobbs is the most guilty of the reckless, irresponsible journalism. Nine-year-old Brescenia Flores shot and killed. And one of the suspects is the national head of the Minutemen American Defense. I support the Minuteman Project and the <coughs> fine Americans who make it up in all they've accomplished fully, relentlessly, and proudly. The invasion of illegal aliens is threatening the health of many Americans. Tuberculosis, uh, leprosy, malaria. Now we want to try to check. <laughs> we can't. Just well, so I can know. tell you this. If we reported it, it's a fact. You <laughs> can't tell me that. You did. Well, no, I just did. You distort the figures. You exaggerate. A third of the uh, prison population in this country uh, is estimated to be illegal alien. About a third of our prison population who are illegal aliens. Six percent of prisoners um, in this country are non-citizens, not even illegal. Uh, yes, but I, and I misspoke. If we reported it, <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs>
The time is now. This video generated 200,000 calls to CNN. 200,000 calls uh, directly to the office of the CEO, to his cell phone, and to his home. The first 100 went, were directed to, to those three uh, targets. The second 100,000 calls to all the sponsors of the Ludovs uh, time. When they were receive a call, say, turn on CNN, it's so important, turn on CNN. And Ludov says, winds of change have come to CNN. This will be my last show. That's why it's so important that you make a decision to do something. Because if you don't, people will be suffering the consequences of you not taking action. But it's not only about I want to run because I feel that I that I need to carry a mission. Is I want to run, but I want to do I want to win. I want to be there, I want to make decisions, I want to make a difference. And that's, that's part of this, this presentation. Your resources are extremely important. Time is probably the most important resource in a political country. You have election day and you cannot change election day. You have either the November election, the May primary, the April primary, the caucus, the whatever in your state applies. And candidates, political campaigns, always wish that we had more time. Always wish that we had done you know, more door knocking, more phone calling, phone banking, more direct mail, more whatever is going to motivate and mobilize our voters. The second one is the money. Political campaigns in this country, are, they need the necessary resources. Volunteer campaigns, unfortunately, have the, 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 the disadvantage of competing with resources in this, in this, in this. Uh, and I think that, for example, what Chuck is doing in this, in, in the whole democratic process, I think is so important. Why? Because it's bringing resources to most needed uh, campaigns, most needed um, elections across the across the country. And people, it's not just about people. It's not about just you know who are my bodies and but. You know, an army of volunteers, an army of, you know, the, the, the talent that you're going to bring to your campaign. That is so important. Bringing the, the right people to your campaign could mean the difference between winning and losing. And that's so critical that you make those uh, right decisions. The first thing that we do with uh, political candidates is a brief memo, which is the initial assessment. And then we do the, the size of the campaign. Our initial assessment has different uh, components. First, we need to know the size of the of the district, the size of the state, the size of the you know whatever we're we're, we're running for. We need to understand the geography. We need to un understand not only you know what, what's what's going on in, in, in this neighborhood, but what kind of culture and what kind of uh, people that we want to find in, in this in this neighborhood. The second thing is the, the demographics, and that's not just you know all. The south side is African American, the west side is Latino, uh, Anglo, GLBT, not only that, but also demographics as of the ages. But that's where we, where we start putting together something that you probably already heard about, you know, political campaigns, mostly from the corporate world, which is not our target. You start peeling the onion in more than one layer and making sure that you understand who is my, my voter that I'm going to go after. And not just this is the white male under 32 or the Hispanic millennial 18 to 24. You need to go even further. A lot of you guys, or I don't know if it's a lot, but you know, you might use match.com because you want to meet the, the, your significant one, right? <laughs> but that's one of the best examples of Michael Target. And it works. Why? Because you're pairing two different people with so many variables of behavior, consumer, demographics, that, that things work. Well, the candidate needs to use micro-targeting to some degree, so he or she can peer and match with your, with your uh, type of order that you're looking for. The issues are so important. But a mistake that a lot of the candidates tend to do is they try to bring their own issue 
to the campaign and to impose what do I feel is the most important issue for me and try to place it in my district, in my uh, state, in, in my election. And that is a big mistake. Issues need to come from people. You have to be in constant communication with people so they can tell you what's the most important thing. If you're running a city council race, you know, you might be dealing with uh, uh, public you know, transportation. You might be dealing with what are the, 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 the services that the city offers, trash collection, you know. As a candidate, I might be inclined to say, well, immigration or jobs in the economy or Obamacare or whatever it is, is the most important issue for me. But that doesn't mean that that's, that is relevant to the voter, uh, you know, in South Philly or in Milwaukee or in, in uh, East LA. So, that is, that is so important that you understand what's going on uh, with your constituency. The second thing, the, third, the fourth thing is past election results. That is so important. We usually go either two or three um, election results to identify how um, this component is going, to, is going to impact our current election. And when I say two or three, is we peer what is um, you know, municipal elections. So if we're doing a city council, we, we match city council races two or three uh, cycles uh, behind. We don't do, we don't expect to see the same type of electorate to come out and vote um, compared, you know, to if you have a gubernatorial election versus a, uh, a presidential election, or if you have a congressional race versus a city council race. It has to be, you, can, you compare apples to apples. City council races with city council races, state reps, state senate, state, <coughs> state senate, state senate and, 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 and so forth. And the, and the two most important components of, of um, our initial assessment is how many votes do I need to win? How much money I need to raise? And our candidates know it. They know that they need 15,236 votes to win. And that the cost per vote is gonna be $12 per vote. That's so important because when you talk to the potential donor or the person that is thinking about voting for you, they want to know that you have a plan. Then they want to know that you understand how you how you're going to win this election. And so that is that is critical to bring legitimacy to the to the campaign, but also to convey that you're an informed candidate and that you understand what it takes to 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 win an election. The size of the campaign, and this is a small component. The next one is going to be blank, but just to give you an idea, this is, you, you have you know you, a lot of a lot of candidates think that they're the campaign manager, and there's not a worse mistake than having a candidate thinking that he or she can run an election. The candidate has three functions, only three: make important decisions, not all the decisions, just the important executive decisions. Number two, raise money. All time, every day, and we've always been attested. And number three, knock on doors, talk to voters. A candidate that doesn't walk the district, a candidate that feels that he or she can go just to different events and wear a tie and shake hands, that, 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 that candidate most likely is going to lose. A candidate needs to talk to the voter. A candidate needs to have that conversation, that connection with, with voters. So you have the campaign manager, um, and this is a, a, an example for a small uh, race, something, you know, um, uh, state rep, state senate, maybe a, 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 a big city, uh, city council or so. And you have three different areas. You have your policy, you have your fundraising and your administration. You know, the policy, of course, you will have your media, you will have the issues, you will have the things that you're going to talk about in the campaign. Research is so important, not only self-research, but opposition research. You need to understand what's going on and how you're going to be perceived by voters, by the other candidate, how you're going to be attacked. We also need to know where are the, the weak sides of the of the um, of your opponent or opponents. So and finally, you know, you need to have a well organized campaign where your candidates don't just running crazy from one place to another and you don't have the time to make those three functions that I explained before. The second thing is, or the second area is uh, fundraising, and you know, it ten, that's that's a, a critical component of the campaign. The way that I that I see a campaign is, is like a road trip. Imagine that you want to go from um, from uh, Boston to LA, and uh, you know you'll have the thousand dollars that you need to 
to you know, fill the tank with gas. You only have $50. So, that, so your campaign's uh, job, or your candidate's job, is to raise the money to go to the next gas station and fill the, fill the tank with gas and save a little bit of money. And then to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one. Another analogy that I use, especially with this type of uh, structure, is political campaigns sometimes tend to think they're playing tennis. And I think baseball is the best uh, sport for a, for a political campaign. When you play tennis, you run from one side of the court to the other, and you're going all over the place. When I play baseball, if I'm first base, or shortstop, or catcher, pitcher, I might not even play during the whole game. But I know that my peers are taking care of their responsibility. And I'm going to be fine with that because we want to win. So you need to have clear, defined functions for each person in your campaign. And that needs to be very well, um, you need to specify that. And then the administration is so important. Why? Because that is going to be the, 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 the actual um, army that is going to move your election, your campaign to, to be successful. You need to have a field component. When I, when I say field, is um, you need to have a, there, there are three different uh, ways to, to produce field. Um, one is door knocking, the other one is phone banking, and direct mail. Those are ways that you communicate directly with your, with your voters. So a lot of people call it uh, voter contact, uh, and it's, uh, it's field. Um, you also need to have an office manager that keeps your campaign um, internally well organized. You need to pay canvassers. Canvassers are people that go and do door knocking. You need to pay the bills. You need to you know, have the internet running. You need to, all the little details have to be well thought and, 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 and planned in advance so you don't have issues of, well, now we don't have um, you know, internet, so what we want to do or, or what have you. And I've seen that on, you know, in, in different campaigns, different sizes, when everything is in place, but you don't have someone that is in charge of the little details that become important issues later on. And then, you know, your volunteer coordinator and your volunteers are so important. People that offer their time uh, to, to help your campaign. It might be that I'm available to knock on doors on Thursday nights only. But that has a direct impact on the, on the budget of your campaign. Because everything in a campaign is, 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 is numbers. How many hours do I need? How many door knocks? Do I need to produce to be able to get enough people to support my candidate, enough, enough people to go out to vote, and enough people to just you know um, support our issues, right? The other one I don't want to complicate this too much, so um, I just want to give you an idea of what a congressional race structure looks like. You're going to have to pay if you uh, want to see that. <laughs> so. You know, you have different areas, you have different um, departments, and so forth. The next thing, and this is where we start getting uh, really into the details of what it takes to, once you make the decision, you already decide the shape of your campaign, the size of your campaign, you already done research, you already, you know, ask the critical questions about why am I running, why am I going to win. So now you're you're 100% for sure you file, and, and you're about to file, and you need to, you need to get the resources. The, so in order to produce a, a good fundraising structure, you have to ask yourself uh, those uh, five points. Let me give you a little, a little um, insight in our company. We're the second largest Latino Democratic firm by the number of, uh, of uh, campaigns that we do every year. However, my overhead is minimal. I have a, a, a rule that is called a five, five, five. Five fundraisers that raised at least $5 million in the past five years. That's my team. Everybody else becomes part of a campaign team. We have about 400 people working right now indirectly for us because we place talent, we recommend people to different campaigns, we send people to different areas, but they are paid by the campaign, not by our firm. That's one of the reasons why we're successful because I can compete with the local person and say, you know what, you're the local uh, consultant, but I'm going to bring the presidential style type of campaign to your city council race or to mayoral race in LA or San Bernardino or Toledo, Ohio or Miami without having to put the burden on your campaign. Our role, and this is 
This is so important, especially for Latinos. Again, we don't run because we don't know how to raise the money and we don't know how to win an election. But we have someone that helps us to raise those resources and help us to spend those resources in a, in a wise way, then we have a, a winning campaign. To give you an example, sometimes you know our cost for, for labor printing is lower and we utilize union printing with Democrats. Um, maybe people here are not, but you know we believe in, in supporting labor. Sometimes it's lower because of the bulk of printing that we that we use than the local printer that is not uh, is not labor, which is great. For us it's our and, and I know labor people don't like this anal analogy, but it's our Walmart approach. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a combination of labor and, and Walmart, right? So let's do the Walmart. Uh, so, anyway, so, so in order to, to, to have a successful fundraising operation, you need to have a message. And that message is different than the campaign message. You need to talk about, number one, introduce yourself, or reintroduce yourself. And I think this is slide. Okay, you need to talk about the message of, 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 of uh, the campaign in terms of fundraising. You need to let people know why you're running, let people know. Uh, what are the issues that are, that are the problem and let uh, your potential donors understand that you're the solution to those problems. And the most important to do the ask, and I want, there's another slide that talks about that. So, but you have to introduce your candidacy, identify the problem, I am the solution, and then pause. And so, uh, Susan, I really, you know, I'm running for office. You and I have been on the same board for many years. And so I want to let you know that Pleasant Grove, which is a small, tiny, uh, new city that became part of Dallas, has been ignored by the past 20 years. We never had representation at City Hall. Last year, there was $645 billion that were allocated to the city. Only $15 million came to, to, to Pleasant Grove. That is the problem. I want to let you know that I'm running because I want to bring a voice to City Hall and to make sure that we have representation from our community in making those decisions. Every year, Dallas City Council members pass a $2.1 billion budget. That means resources for our families, for our schools, for police, firefighters, etc. So Susan, will you be willing to, be, to contribute $500 to the campaign? And then silence. <laughs> <laughs> so good. And, and I'm going to ask each of you, so I'm going to walk here with some, uh, some cash. But a lot of people say, okay, fundraising is, is, is probably the toughest uh, component of a campaign. Why? Because why Susan is going to give me $500? Well, there's, there's different reasons. And the first one is the candidate needs to understand that in terms of fundraising, he or she is the chief fundraiser and the chief campaigner. Which means <coughs> energy she needs to be calling individuals for resources. If I tell Carlos to tell um, Mario to invite Susan to a party tomorrow in my house and that she needs to bring a beer, she might not even come. Right? Because it's a change. But if I call Susan and say, hey Susan, I really need your help, you bring the beer. Sure, why not? Or at least I'm going to get an answer, a yes or a no answer. Right? The second thing is donors want to build a relationship with a candidate. Even if he or she's already my friend, they want to have that connection. And that is so important. And so the next circle is, so who gives to a, to a political campaign? The first universe is my personal universe. That is the friends and family. Why are they going to give money to me? Well, because they love me. Because they're my cousin, because they're my friend, because they want to see me succeed. They don't care about how, how well am I polling or how, what is the size of my campaign or why, you know, why am I running, what are the most important issues. They want to see, see me succeed. Second thing, so um, when, do they, when do they give money? Early in the campaign. <coughs> this is the start of the money. This is what is going to allow you to really build an operation from scratch to a, successful, to, to a successful campaign. And for those of you who are in the business school, you know, you 
talk about how to start a business and how to make it you know, profitable in Fortune 500 and become a millionaire, believe me, political campaigns are mom and pop business that become Fortune 500 companies in one cycle, from zero to 100 and then zero again. And then the next cycle, you have to rebuild the operation. You raise all the money, you spend all the money, you use everything that you have, you expand, you campaigns explode so fast that one day the candidate walks in and they're like, what's going on here? I don't even know half of these people. They're all committed, they're all phone banking, they're all you know, marching and knocking on doors and, 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 and you know, communicating to voters. So the personal universe is so important. The second universe is the ideology. So I'm a Latino, I want to run for office. Who's going to give money to me? People that look like me, people that think like me. So this is people that share my ideas and there's an affinity with me as a candidate. 2008, we're in a campaign in Utah. <laughs> and the first thing that we, that we found is that we, have, we had a challenger that Senator was wrong sitting here, and it was so hard for us to convince people in the state of Utah that she was a viable candidate. So what did we do? We went elsewhere with people that had opinion with Senator Robles, at the time 27-year-old girl that wanted to be a senator. And we talked to those, those individuals and say, well, there's an affinity, you know, you'll be part of this board, she's a Latina, she's a progressive woman, all those things came into place. And we raised a substantial amount of money, so she won the primary. So she had the resources to do that. The second thing is, you know, who those are religious, you know, people in my church, people in my um, community, cultural, ethnic groups. I was a member of LULAC. Well, I'm going to go to the LULACers. I'm, you know, being a, you know, sponsored by the Harvard alumni, whatever it is, right? And when do they give money? They give you money when they decide that your platform represents their issues. And that's so important. Because by that, by that time you need to say, okay, this is where I stand in terms of whatever that issue. Right? Those are ideological issues, right? You know, Same-sex marriage, immigration reform, whatever is affecting your, your universe and your, your district. The, um, the third uh, universe, that's where the money is. So this is the power universe. These are the ones that directly benefit from having a relationship with the candidate. You will not, so, so why do they want to support your campaign? They want to support your campaign because they want to advance their interest. I am a developer, I am a lobbyist, I am an organization, I have a PAC. I need to see viability from my candidate in order to support that race. So, when do they give money? Once you start polling, what? Once your name is, 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 is building name recognition, you're branding your campaign. Once enough media is coming out and people are talking about Chuck is running and he's doing great, you need to talk to him. So the firefighters association, the police association, you know, the, the she should run, you know, different packs and organizations are gonna start talking about why it's important to be to this candidate. They're going to send you questionnaires to see where you're in different issues. You're going to reply to those questions, and based on those questions, they're going to analyze. Say, you know what, this person is worth it for me to, for this pack to invest in um, my money. So, this is, this is, so, and in, 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 in terms of, of, of the fundraising, um, you have to follow a very well organized path. People think that just because I live in a district that uh, you know has um, sports, professional sports, that, you know the Dallas Cowboys or the American Airlines Center. They all gonna come and say, okay, here's a bunch of money just because you are running for office in this area, or if I live, you know, in, in Los Angeles or or Miami or all these places, they gonna just come naturally. You know, you have to build an operation. You have to build that relationship. You have to first finish the first stage, friends and family, then the ideology, then the, 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 the power of the right way. Think. So there's other, other circles in the campaign is, 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 is bigger. So if you're running, for example, against an incumbent. So 
there's the people that is mad with the decisions that that incumbent uh, made last cycle. He voted for whatever. And because I did not get the contract, I'm going to give, give the money to whomever is running against this guy. There's a lot of people that is in direct benefit, certainly. So, you know, uh, in the city of uh, San Bernardino, it's a bankruptcy we're representing right now, a candidate for mayor over there. So, um, you know, I am the police chief. And, you know, I know the, 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 um, that there's going to be X amount of vehicles that, that the city is going to buy next year. And so, you know, the person who has the dealership is going to say, oh, here's the, the, the money for the mayoral race. But the person that service those vehicles might be also, you know, approached not necessarily by the candidate, but by the dealership and say, you know what, John, this guy's doing good. If he wins, chances are that we're going to sell a bunch of cars, and chances are that you're going to be servicing those vehicles. And depending on the size of how much money I'm going to make on that deal, and I'm being very blunt here, but democracy is that way, unfortunately, that's the, the size of my, uh, of my contribution. So, communications is so important as well. Don't confuse the communication component and the messaging for the campaign with the messaging for fundraising. They have to be similar, but they're different. You have to have a, a, a message that is easy to remember, credible, and contrasting. You want to compare and contrast yourself with your opponent. You want to make sure that there's a clear dis distinction of who am I versus my opponent. You want to make sure that you utilize the opposition research that you build, the issues that you already stand for, the resources that you have to be able to compare and contrast yourself. And there are different ways to do that. I want to skip this and then go to my paper. So feel this is so important. This is the real deal. Once you have all the operation, you have the money, you have the resources, you have the people, now it's time to go out there and identify voters. And how do you do it? You classify voters by the voting history and by the likeliness to vote for you. And here's the way it works. What we do is we start putting those uh, voters in different categories. The super voters are high propensity, the sporadics, and the low propensity. Those are the ones that we want to reach. And hopefully, we have enough of the high propensity voters that we feel comfortable that we're going to win the race, right? Because those are people that voted in three out of the last three um, election cycles. Sporadics, two out of the last three. Low propensity, one out of the last three. Why is that so important? Because candidates and campaigns spend so much time saying, well, you know, I went to this event, and there was 100 people there. And they assume that 100 people is going to vote. When I get them, they're not even registered to vote. And the ones that are registered to vote, they haven't even voted to vote. It's so much harder to mobilize someone that hasn't voted than someone that has a history of constantly going to the polls. So you want to identify those voters. The next um, important thing about classifying your voters is the three steps that every campaign does. First step, you've got to ID your voters. And we usually, and this is you know across the board, Democrats and Republicans, we do the same. It's about you know five um, different categories. You go and open the door. Angelo, my name is Herman. I'm a volunteer for Karina Carrasco, who's running for for May. Are you going to vote for her? You're going to get one of five answers. Yes, like a yes. I'm undecided. Like a no or no. This is so important because the yeses that you're going to get based on the, on the memo that you put together that says that you need 42,359 votes, you're going to start putting those yeses in a TV for election day, for GOTV. The likely and the undecideds, you're going to separate in a different category for persuasion. And the no's and likely no's, I'm sorry, but I'm going to take them off my ear because the time and money that takes from moving a no or likely no to a persuadable or to a yes is much more higher and sometimes impossible 
than to identify your, your, your categories of like and yes and other sites. The second thing you want to do is persuade. You want to ask <coughs> Angelo a question. So out of the following five issues, which one is the most important to you? Jobs in the economy, immigration, healthcare, education. And he's going to say, you know what? Education is the one for me, but I'm an undecided. So I already have an undecided that I want to persuade on an education message. What that means? That when I go back and revisit him, I'm going to say Karina's uh, component, Karina's platform on education is A, B, and C. When the direct mail hits his house, he's going to hear about education. And his wife, who is on the side as well and cares about healthcare, is going to receive a robocall or a direct uh, or a phone banking call that talks about uh, healthcare. You need to personalize every step of the election. And the last one, my favorite, GOTV, get out of the vote. And that is so important. Different constituencies do it in a different way. You know, Latinos would like to do it. You know, sometimes you see in, a, in, a, in a Jersey, in Philly, you know, uh, the, those carnavales, the Puerto Rican communities, you see it, you know, for example, in, a, in, a, in a Las Vegas, you have the, the, the unions working and mobilizing in the casinos. I mean, it is, it is different. In, in, in Utah, you have the caucuses, you have, you know, so it is, it is, it is really interesting. African American communities, you have the souls to the polls operation, which means you go to church, and after that, you know, there's a big GOTV mobilization. I mean, you have to understand your procedures. The GLBT communities, they do happy hours, they do, you know, so, so it is, it, you have to know exactly what motivates that community, because that is so important. So to end my presentation, I'll give you some time for questions and answers. I want to end with a video, which is, to me, is very important. Why? Because this is, going to, this is going to tell you that all this process is worth it. And it's worth it because it makes a difference. Well, the feds aren't going to do anything. States need to step up. At least that's what our next guest says. And it's about illegal immigration. So what is her plan? Joyce Lyme is Democratic State Senator from Utah. Louis <laughs> Robles. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, so uh, what's your idea to handle the uh, illegal immigration issue in your state of Utah? Well, we're trying to find a proactive solution that stays away from a catch and release only enforcement mechanism where we can account for individuals, have them pay taxes, quantify that uh, <coughs> amount of money that they're paying into the system, have them take English classes, civics classes, more of an integration, accountability, and a public safety mechanism. So, it, so basically, and I don't mean to minimize, but it's, it's a work permit situation where you know who's there, person doesn't have a right to vote, but person pays taxes, and you, and you know if the person has a criminal record or not. Is that essentially what it would be? And you find somebody who doesn't comply. Correct. I mean, there's all of those, those components. One thing that I do want to clarify is that it's not adjusted immigration status. We're just saying, within the state of Utah, we want to have something in place that accounts for those individuals, like you said, we will have criminal background checks done on all of them. They will have to pay a processing fee that will pay for the whole program itself, have them take English classes, civics classes, and be able to pay taxes because they're already working. They're here. And we know that's a state. We have no power to remove them from the country. So we're very frustrated with the federal government for their failure to do something. But we have to do something as a state. We will do something more proactive versus a reactionary approach. Well, if you don't use the word immigration, uh, you might be better off because that sort of takes it out of the federal uh, uh, area. I mean, it, then you might have a, you know, if it has a, you might have a better shot at it by doing this. Um, uh, who's opposed to you on this? Well, I think there's obviously people that feel this is, again, providing immigration status to individuals. We're not doing that. I think this is a proactive solution. I think this is what the state of Utah feels more comfortable. It has to do a lot with our culture. I mean, we are not here to be separating families and then having a catch and release type of legislation like the Arizona type of law. We're just saying, let us do something, federal government. If you're not going to do anything, and obviously it doesn't seem like they're moving towards that direction, let us find a solution that works for us, that doesn't hurt our economy, and that is more fiscally responsible. And we believe a group of individuals, including some conservatives, that this is a way to, to go. We obviously have a position, and it's going to be individuals that feel um, the immigrants, so this type of undocumented immigrants shouldn't be here. But again, it's not within the state purview or within our jurisdiction to remove those individuals. 
Who, who are you getting more resistance from and, and, more, and who's more receptive? Your own party, the Democratic Party in Utah, or the Republican Party? You know, I, I, I have to say, with regards to the legislature, we just barely released the bill. It's been a working process. We had a lot of conservative groups, uh, religious organizations working with us. We have the Sutherland Institute, which is considered probably the most conservative think tank in the state of Utah, working with us hand in hand. So I think at this point, it's mostly uh, individuals that care and they want to find a solution that is not an Arizona type of law. But um, the, my colleagues are still debating. I mean, this is barely out. We're starting our session on January, so we still have some time to work this out. And we are willing and open to make changes. But this is a different idea. We are just trying to be proactive and trying to find a solution that is different from an enforcement-only mechanism. Uh, is the law in Arizona having any impact on you? I mean, are people leaving uh, Utah, they're actually just doing a pass-through because of Arizona and going on to your state or not? I mean, has your, has your illegal immigration uh, issue uh, grown in the last year? Yeah, I mean, we've seen some increases of migration to the state, and we've seen, obviously, some undocumented immigrants. I'm not sure that uh, the Arizona law has an impact. I think it has an impact on all the border states, I mean, all the neighbor states of Arizona. But I'm not sure that we can quantify for that, and that's why this is important. We don't even know who these individuals are. We don't know where they live, and this will actually allow us to know who they are, where they live, and make sure we have the criminal elements removed from our state. We don't want them here. We don't want criminals either. But if they're here already, the ones that are working and providing for their families, the soccer mom that is taking one of their kids to school and maybe speeding by five miles, we don't think that the best approach is to put our state funds into detaining these individuals when we know Homeland Security most likely won't come and remove that person and then having them to be released again. We only have 40 seconds left, so tell me, how is illegal immigration hurting your state? I think illegal immigration is hurting the entire country in a way of uh, not having an orderly process for these individuals to be here. And um, at the same time, I think they're also contributing to our community. So I think we need to have a mechanism that could bring both of them together and make sure we have places where they can, you know, quantify for them, account for them, and make sure they're paying into our system, and they can integrate through English classes and civics classes. So that's the purpose of the bill. Stay Sarah, thank you. And of course, we'll be watching to see what happens uh, when your bill uh, gets uh, voted out eventually. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Here's the deal. You have the immigrant senator of the state of Utah, and National Fox, which is the most conservative network, utilizing their message to stop the Arizona law to be put in place in, in Utah. With a minority Democratic um, Senate and a compromise, we were able to stop the Arizona law to pass in Utah. She was able to do it. Jose Sanchez was a legal counsel for, for that, that whole um, component on the policy. And so the issue is what is your message, what is your goal? And we got so this is why it's so important that when you live here, you will say, okay, what exactly is my mission? Am I ready? Am I going to be running for office? And what is what I want to accomplish? And so I want to thank the senator for the thousands of people in the state of Utah that are still thanking you for, for your leadership and for your integrity and for doing what it takes to defend our community. But thank you everyone. Good news and bad news. The bad news is we're not going to have any time for questions. Uh. And I apologize that because we have to get back to the room for the awards banquet and then uh, Mr. Castro is on a tight time schedule. So we want to make sure that we uh, have the opportunity to listen to him fully. The good news is that her mind is going to be here all day, all night. Charging so at the reception. <laughs> he'll be at the reception after Castro speaks and he'll be at the Club Havana tonight as well. So you'll have plenty of time to have some one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with you, okay? So please uh, please be quick to get back to the, to the AIDS courtroom. Thank you all.